Hey guys, I've introduced a lot of free new features and improvements to Alert Time Lab 7 since it was initially released. I've announced these via blog posts on alerttimelabs.com, but of course, I understand that showing them in a video is much more accessible. That's why today I want to walk you through the most important improvements in Alert Time Lab 7 since its release a little bit over one year ago. So let's dig right into it. The first changes would be two platform specific changes. First of all, I think all Mac users will be happy that now LR Timelapse is able to remove those dock icons from the Adobe DNG converter. Every time LR Timelapse was creating visual previews or exporting a video sequence, the Adobe DNG converter would come up with those dock icons. Basically, Adobe doesn't provide a way to remove them. So what I had to do is implement a patch to that removes that icon, then it signs the application again. You just have to go to the tools menu and then you do remove dock icon from the NG converter. This will give you a short notification explaining what's going to happen. You click on OK and then you just go through this installer, enter your password and then you need to allow that this installer app modifies apps on your Mac. It will only modify the Adobe DNG converter, of course. Basically, that's it. You close this installer and next time you trigger the visual preview generation, for example, by holding shift and clicking on save, you'll see we get new visual previews without the annoying icon jumping in the dock. The next platform specific change concerns those who are using a Windows on ARM machine, like with this new Snapdragon processor. And there is now a native version for those Windows on ARM machines. You can just download it from lrtimelapse.com slash download, install the native version on your Windows on ARM machine. Also make sure to install the Adobe DNG converter for Windows on ARM. The link will be on the install page of our time lapse. Then you will be set and everything will be much snappier on your brand new hardware. Should you ever get stuck with alert time lapse, some settings messed up, you want to start over or maybe it doesn't launch at all or whatever. First thing to try would be to reset the settings. And this is very easy now because you can just hold the shift key while launching alert time lapse, and then it will ask you if you want to reset your configuration and then you agree to that and you will have a clean start, which will possibly solve your problems. Another nice addition is delete to trash will now be the default. To delete some files, they will be moved to the system's trash if supported. You can turn off that delete to trash if you want to delete directly and permanently. Just go to settings under files and folders. There you will have that. Option. Let's talk about the Lightroom AI tools that some of you love to use. The AI tools like Denoise, Super Resolution, RAW Enhancements in Lightroom used to require a conversion to DNG. This is what Lightroom did until a couple of weeks ago. But now Adobe changed that behavior in one of the last versions. Now you can activate those tools directly in the tools panel in Lightroom, which makes it a little bit intransparent. The good thing is that Lightroom doesn't require the conversion to DNG anymore. On the other hand, it requires those AI tools to be calculated and generated, which has its challenges when working with LR Timelapse. The problem is that LR Timelapse used to just migrate those tools from the first image to all other images when doing the auto transition. There is no way for LR Timelapse to trigger the recalculation of those tools in Lightroom. This is technically not possible. The way of just copying everything would not really work well because then the regeneration could, could not be triggered and you would have the wrong tools applied to the other images. So this is why now LR Time Lapse removes those tools when you hit auto transition. This is done by purpose and you will get a message explaining what's going on and telling you that you should apply those tools if you really want to 
at the very end of the workflow right before exporting. And then you just can put the denoise, for example, on the very first frame and synchronize it to all of the other frames. This is the only way to have Lightroom really recalculating that setting for all images. And this is what you need. Sorry, guys, but there is no other way we can implement that into LR time lapse. But I think it's a good way. But this being said, personally, I'm not a big fan of those AI tools for time lapse. I mean, they are great for single images, for stills, but for time lapse, they are have a couple of disadvantages because it's AI, they will work differently on every image. This might introduce artifacts for your time lapse. Second, usually you don't need that AI denoise for time lapse because denoising in time lapse is not as crucial as for still images. You can rather use the motion blur, for example, when rendering. This will crossfade the images and significantly lower the noise level on your time lapse. And therefore, usually on well shot sequences, there is no need for that AI denoise. But as I just explained, you can use it if you want. Just try it by yourself. And if you get good results, cool. The next change I did was on the restricted folders. If you don't use them, I can really, really recommend them because working with those restricted folders will give you much cleaner tree in the main window of LR timelapse. You will only see those folders, which makes everything faster and everything much more organized. The first change is that they will now be sorted alphabetically. I mean, that's a cool thing because then you can see the similar folders one below the other. The next change is that nested folders will not be accepted anymore because they could cause duplicate folders in the tree, which again would be a performance killer and uh, make everything confusing. And also if you add a parent folder to one of the folders that are already in the list, then the parent folder will get added, but the subfolders will be removed. Also, when you add folders here from that dialog, the last folder in that folder chooser will be remembered the next time the tree will also be opened at that position. In the context menus of the directory trees, for example, in the importer, but also in the main tree, there is now an option navigate to a specific folders, which would open up a little dialog where you can just paste a full path and LR timers will directly navigate there. This might be a shortcut if you need to navigate to a certain path on your system. That feature can also be triggered by clicking in the text field for the source or destination folder in the importer. Some of you might not even know it, but there is a pop-up editor right in the table. So if you double click on one of those numbers in the table, you can just edit it. In the latest version now, that editor works more reliable. You can just click inside to edit it. You can commit it with enter. You can just click outside. It works much better than before. Of course, now with the editor on the right side with the sliders, it's not that important anymore to being able to edit directly in the table, but still it's a good thing, especially for tools that are not present in the slider editor. Batch processing has also been improved. The batch auto transition, for example, now allows to process subfolders as it was possible with other batch operations. If you do batch operations, formally you could just skip finished folders, but now also folders that have been removed and also folders marked as trash can be skipped. The logger in LR timelapse is very important. If you have any issues that you want to report to me, then usually you would send me that log. But also if you are an advanced user, the log might be interesting for you to just see what's going on under the hood so now we can just leave the logger dialog open and it will be auto update as new entries are being added. The position of the logger dialog and if it's visible will also be saved now. So if you close LR timelapse with an open logger dialog, 
it will be reopened with that dialog at the same position. The same goes for the preview pop out. If you decide to pop out the preview, for example, to put it on a second screen, then on the next relaunch, it will be there again without you having to pop it out again. Also, there have been some improvements in the video rendering. The most important for me is that now we have HDR support for ProRes files and DNX HR in LR Timelapse Pro. Before, HDR has been only enabled for H.265 codecs. Now we have the more professional codecs ProRes and DNX HR also supported with HDR. Additionally, now we have support for 5 to 4 and 4 to 5 aspect ratios in the render dialog. For example, if you want to export directly for Instagram. The crop position slider now will show a little label where you can see the number which it has been set to. This makes it easier to reposition the crop on different sequences if you want to have the same crop position on those sequences. In the composition dialog now, the preview will scale so that you can better see what's going on. Let's speak about camera profiles. Usually, LR Time Labs initializes sequences with the camera standard profile because it turned out that the camera standard profile that Adobe provides for many cameras is one of the best for time lapse photography. Not every profile is really suited for time lapse. For example, the default Adobe color profile is not so good for time lapse because it might introduce some contrast flicker. So if you can and Adobe supports your camera with the camera standard profile, use that one. And Adobe provides that for Nikon, Canon, Sony, and Panasonic. LR Timelapse will automatically use it when initializing. But if you want to use some other profile now, you have the option to set that profile in the settings under color management. This allows to override the camera profile that LR Timelapse sets on initialization. Proxies have been introduced in LR Timelapse 7 and by default they provide a huge performance gain. Proxy mode is on for all sequence by default, but you can change that in the expert settings of LR Timelapse. So you can turn off proxies if you don't want them. I don't recommend it, just leave them on. But now we have also the option to set proxies per sequence. So there is a little proxy toggle button above the table that you can just use to toggle off the proxies for a certain sequence. Especially when you work with very dark sequences or sequences where you find that the flicker is not really working well because they have strong edits and so on, the first thing to try would be to turn off the proxies and try to recreate the visual previews without proxies. Once you click that button, the visual previews will automatically be generated and then with or without proxies depending on how it's set. This should always be the first troubleshooting. If something doesn't work with your sequence, then turn off the proxies, try again, and usually then the deflicker will work better for very difficult sequences. It's always a trade-off. With the proxies, you gain a lot of speed, but the accuracy is not as high, of course. Without the proxies, you have a higher accuracy, but it will take a little bit longer. Speaking about the flicker, I've added a checkbox ignore blacks and whites to the deflicker panel. This will also trigger a recalculation of the luminance curve and it will dim the extreme areas of the histogram, the blacks and the whites when calculating that luminance curves. This means the blacks and whites will not be very present in the information used for the flicker. This might be useful for image sequences with a large black or white area. This setting will also be remembered per sequence and you could even set it as a default by clicking on the default settings in deflicker, which will store that chosen settings for the next deflicker operation. This ignore blacks and whites should only be used if you really work with very low key or high key images. Otherwise, just leave it off and you will get better results. I've also improved the way the histogram is being displayed. It will work much better now for such images with very dark or very bright areas. 
I hope you appreciate those new features and improvements as I do. Leave a like and subscribe to my channel if you like the video. And if you have any ideas or suggestions for LR Timelapse features, please post them in the feature request board of the LR Timelapse forum. The constant improvements in LR Timelapse are also community driven. I really appreciate any input from you. By the way, if you're still on LR Timelapse 6, you should definitely check out my video with the big news in version 7, additionally to what I showed you today. Also make sure to subscribe to my newsletter because that's what I use to notify you whenever I release a new version and that way you won't miss any of the new and great features that might be very valuable for your daily work with LR Timelapse. See you next time. Bye-bye.